Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Chief Sustainability Officers Clinical Fellow Scheme 2022-23 About the Scheme webinar. Welcome to everybody who has joined us after work, after busy days. We're delighted you can join us. Okay, so first of all, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Donna Hickford. I'm Head of Professional Services for the Faculty of Medical Leadership and Management. FMLM have the absolute pleasure of running this scheme on behalf of the Chief Sustainability Officer of NHS England, NHS Improvement. So before we get started, I'm just going to go through a few housekeeping rules. The first thing is to say that this webinar is recorded and it will be published. If you are uncomfortable with being on screen, please do turn your camera off. Please ensure that you keep your microphones on mute. You'll be able to sub, uh, submit questions as we go through. Um, but we do ask that you keep your microphones throughout. Uh, you'll see there's a chat box in, uh, on, on your screen. Please feel free to submit questions as, you, as we go through the webinar. Um, if you have any questions, particularly to any of our speakers as you hear them, if you could just direct them to a particular speaker using their name in the question box, that would be really helpful. So thinking about the aims of this webinar, the aim is to provide a, a much clearer picture of what this scheme is, what it's about, what it offers, and really the kind of opportunities that it will afford you as a clinician and as an aspiring clinical leader, which is what it's all about. We'll cover some logistics of this scheme, such as um, contracts, um, etc. But we're not going to go into detail about that tonight because tonight's webinar is about hearing from the clinical fellows themselves to understand more about their own experiences and their advice to you if you're considering taking up this scheme. Okay, a little bit about the scheme itself. As I said, it's, it's managed by the Faculty of Medical Leadership and Management, who run a number, a wide portfolio of multi-professional clinical fellow schemes, and we have done since 2011. We're really delighted to partner with the Chief Sustainability Officer and their team in running this scheme. So, as you know, you as you'll be interested that's brought you here tonight sustainable healthcare is now recognized as one of the biggest problems priorities and challenges facing healthcare the scheme has been established in recognition of that and to be effective we need clinical leaders within the system that not only understand these problems but can lead really meaningful change both in services and across the workforce so the scheme is in its infancy um, and this cohort will, wel will welcome our second cohort of, of trailblazing sustainability fellows. The scheme remains in its pilot phase, so both the current fellows and future clinical fellows will continually help us to shape the future of this scheme. So a little bit about the scheme itself, the clinical fellows tonight will give you a lot more of an insight in terms of what it feels like and what it looks like, but in short, you as fellows work in an apprenticeship type model of learning. And what that means in, in very plain terms is that it's on the job learning. So to do this, you'll be seconded from your current employer for 12 months from September of this year. So fellows will have the opportunity to work with some of the most senior leaders and, and teams within the NHS. And you'll be leading, leading on meaningful project that supports um, the NHS net zero strategy um, and or, uh, and projects that are essentially fundamentally trying to change the way that care is designed and delivered across the system. So it's a really exciting and innovative opportunity. The scheme is open to the seven core healthcare professionals, as you've seen here, who must have the primary pro uh, professional qualification and be registered with the relevant regulator or register. So a little bit about what the scheme offers. So you'll hear in much more detail from the fellows themselves tonight about what the scheme has we offered to them. The what the scheme has offered to them. But there are four key areas that I really wanted to highlight before we get okay. into that detail. Okay. So the first one is the opportunity to lead on meaningful and impactful projects, which the clinical fellows will talk about more in a moment. The second one is a really truly enhanced skill set that you may just not have the opportunity to gain in such a short intensive period and it's not just about how to lead and how to deliver a project. You take which, five minutes and take the fish out. 
which is of course very important, but the scheme aims to focus on a much broader set of skills to enable you to then translate those back into your own clinical practice. So that's things like skills like the ability to lead change, deal with really complex issues, communicate and influence stakeholders at, at all levels, as well as a very high level understanding of sustainability principles and how to translate policy into and to support implementation, which is so critical for sustainable healthcare. The third element is the scheme provides a very comprehensive 12 month, what we call a wraparound development programme, which aims to equip fellows to be able to succeed in the scheme, but also to provide you and help develop, develop a range of um, leadership competencies and deeper awareness. And the joy of the education programme is it brings sustainability fellows together with national and regional fellows from other schemes and counterpart schemes across the UK. The, uh, provide the opportunity to, to share learning and, and network. And this is really around the fourth, fourth area that I wanted to point out. So the scheme brings massive opportunities for team working, not only within your project teams, within NHS England teams and directorates, but also across organisations within your cohort and across the different schemes that I've described. And underpinning all of these elements, um, it's the what next. What happens at the end of the 12 months once you've had these fantastic opportunities and met all these people and delivered some really exciting projects? Well, when fellows complete their fellowship, the next step is then being part of a much wider network, a network of alumni, which clinical fellows have the opportunity to be part of as a clinical fellow alumni scheme, which in at the end of this year will surpass 400 multi-professional fellows that go back to 2011. So a really diverse mix wide network of fellows and opportunities to engage with after the scheme. So I'm just going to take a moment to talk about arrangements. Now I should say all of this information is detailed um, quite specifically in the information pack that's available on the FLM website under the sustainability scheme pages. We're not going to go into too much detail about this tonight because really we want to focus on, on, the, on the clinical fellows and, and the insights they want to share. If you do have specific questions about any of these elements, please email the team at clinicalfellowscheme at fmlm.ac.uk, which I'll repeat at the end of the webinar, and we'll be able to provide some more guidance. Um, but thinking about the arrangements broadly, uh, so these clinical fellow posts are offered as full-time opportunities, really due to the very intensive nature of, of, of quite a short 12-month fellowship. Um, but NHS England and NHS Improvement are able to support less than full-time fellowships, ideally at a 0.8 full-time equivalent, in order to provide some flexibility because we appreciate um, other commitments. So fellows will be placed within one of a, a wide variety of directorates within NHS England and NHS Improvement. Um, for 2022-23 cohort, this will be based in London with an expectation um, based on current NHS policy of three days a week in the office and two days flexible homeworking. Our aim working with NHS England is to grow the scheme over the next two years to expand the number of host organisations and posts and also the geographical basis of these posts. So again, the salary is outlined in the information pack, uh, but just for clarity, it is set at Agenda for Change Band 8A. And for doctors who are, of course, subject to a different um, contract, they're paid at the base salary at the training grade that they would have progressed to in September had they stayed in training. So if you're an ST4, you would be pitched at the ST5 level. And there's a fixed uplift that is applied to that because banding and uplifts are not applied to this salary. As I said, all details are available um, in detail in the information pack, but feel free to send any queries to FMLM. Okay, I'm going to pause at that juncture. I'm just going to double check any questions. So the only questions coming through is about the geography. So for this year, the posts are based in London. As I said, we are working with NHS England to try to expand that for future posts. Um, and we're trying to uh, allow as much flexibility with 0.8 
um, uh, full-time equivalents and also the uh, three days a week in London, two days a week from home. Okay, at this point, I will, I will turn to the questions at the end to make sure that we capture everybody's thinking. But I don't want to uh, de delay our clinical fellows anymore. So I'd like to invite Becky as our first uh, clinical fellow speaker. Becky. Thanks, Donna. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome. And so just sort of tell you a bit about what attracted me to the scheme um, and uh, some kind of pros and cons in case any of you are thinking the same things. Um, so my background is I'm an anaesthetic registrar uh, ST6 and had a few years out of training doing some extra things like paediatric intensive care and retrieval um, and I'd been doing sustainability projects for a few years um, which led to me setting up the Green Anaesthetic Green Intensive Care Network in the West Midlands um, and this job came up and I thought wow that looks like a brilliant opportunity and not sure I want to take another year out of training, let me think about it, but um, the, the chance to really improve my sustainability knowledge and influence was, was too good to pass up really. Um, next slide please, Donna. So when I was thinking about whether to apply, I was thinking, you know, well, what can I get and what can I give? So in terms of what I can get, um, kind of that leadership training um, over a year, particularly being a couple of years off a consultant post, I thought would be really beneficial. And um, there's mentoring involved with senior leaders. Um, growth is a big value of mine. So the ability to, to grow through that process, you know, it's a lot of starting a project from scratch you know taking on the things you want to take on and so you have plenty of time to think about what interests you what you want to do and there's plenty of moments of discomfort as well so there's plenty of growth involved um, and I would improve my knowledge but also what can I give and that is that kind of contribution to the cause really of, of net zero and I really wanted to be part of that and there's so much going on with it there's so much funding going into it so much policy development that it's a really exciting area to work in and also to bring that knowledge back to the network that I run and to be able to further that and accelerate our progress but I had a few doubts in terms of do I really want to take another year out and delay my CCT? Um, for me, there was a curriculum change, which meant more paperwork, uh, no clinical for a year. And so I kind of weighed those things up. But there's such a fab opportunity and you don't get similar opportunities when you're a consultant. So, you know, if I had a trainee coming to me, I'd advise them to do it. So, yeah, I decided to go for it. I talked to a couple of people who'd done the National Medical Director schemes um, because there were no alumni for this scheme at the time. Um, and just got a feel for what they'd got out of it. And they had really positive feedback um, and they really encouraged me to go for it. Um, a tip from that, I would say talk to lots of people about it. Um, talk to your TPD early or whoever gives you permission to go out of your job for a year um, and just make sure it's the right choice for you. Um, the location was an issue for me. I don't, I'm a six hour round trip from London. But um, I kind of made my peace with the fact that if I wanted to do this, it was based in London at the time. So I'd have to, you know, make it work somehow. Um, and that's what I decided in the end. Um, next slide, please, Donna. So, yeah, it's really about deciding, you know, what works for you and talking to people about it. And if you can get someone to look over your application form, you know, all the better to help you and, um, you know, just share the load. So. What I'm working on, and um, so I'm working with the Greener NHS. I couldn't help getting involved in a bit of anaesthetics. Um, so I'm working on nitrous oxide um, and also a bit of green theatres. And I set up a network of other fellows interested in sustainability. There are seven of us are chief sustainability officers, but there's lots of fellows interested in sustainability. So we've been able to kind of network, collaborate on projects and help each other out, which is great. Um, managed to do lots of kind of writing blogs, get involved in Twitter chat, speaking. And um, so there's plenty of opportunities to get the word out about Net Zero. And I'm also working in, with the National Director for Transformation um, and working on things like low carbon models of care. Um, one of those being providing NHS services at home. So it's really exciting, lots and lots to do and still seven months left. So, so hoping to get plenty done in that time. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to hand over to the next fellows um, projects that are ongoing as well, which is great. Next slide, please, Donna. And so that just brings me to the future. Um, you know, it's hard to predict the future, um, but I know that certainly going back into my clinical job with the skills that I've got already, um, is gonna be fantastic. It's gonna be brilliant. Um, experience for taking on a consultant job and the perhaps leadership and managerial aspects of that but also with so much sustainability knowledge to be able to forge a path forward so 
that's the future for me and I'll hand over to Emma next. Thanks so much, Becky. Um, hi, everyone. Um, absolutely wonderful to be here. Um, my name is Emma. I am a registered nurse and um, I am here. Yeah, I'm here to talk to you about the uh, fellowship. So what really motivated me um, to apply was actually being able to go from doing things locally to actually looking at the whole system change. And I think one of the amazing things about working you know, within the NHS is that we can try and make that system change and make big things happen and hopefully make the sustainable um, sustainable choices easier for everyone to be able to, to make. Um, and I think the other one of my other big motivating um, factors was sort of promoting the role of the nurse within all of these conversations and thinking, especially at senior leadership level, let's make sure we've got all of the different um, professions um, there um, because I think we work together as a multidisciplinary team let's make these decisions and policy changes and um, sort of system changes as a multidisciplinary team as well um, and I think as a as a profession as nurses we we have so much to bring we have a huge collective potential we want you know the most trusted profession and also we're often working the closest to people who are um, the most affected by climate change and the impact that actually experienced the impact of climate change, especially, um, you know, a lot of my colleagues working in um, community based services um, in public health roles. Um, there is so much we can bring to this um, conversation. Um, my approach to the application was to try and really not undervalue the skills and experience that I had. I think sometimes um, we can take for granted the things that we're actually doing and the skills that we're bringing and, and especially during COVID, a lot of us have um, had to show a lot of resilience and adapt, adapt, adapted our roles and, and those are really important skills. And I really wanted to um, improve my leadership skills, um, which is why I really wanted to go for this. Um, one of the other things that I thought long and hard about was how to kind of, in the application, combine sustainability, uh, experience and leadership and aspirations. And I think one of the tips would be to try and be able to combine all of that in quite a succinct um, few paragraphs. So, the, the, you know, when you're answering the questions, there's 200, 300 words only. Um, and I would just encourage you to try and think about how you're how you're making sure you're kind of combining all of those different com components. Um, it's, it's an absolute privilege to be part of this role, to, to have this role. Um, I have spent um, a lot, the, la the first few months really making connections, building relationships, um, really uh, promoting um, the role of the nurse within the Greener NHS team and bringing um, sort of the clinical input into a lot of the conversations that we're having. And um, I hope that's going well. And also, embedding everything to do with the Greener NHS into the team CNO. So bringing all of that knowledge and skill from the Greener NHS into other parts of the NHS. Um, it's amazing to be working across systems like this. And um, I've had opportunities to be mentored and to learn from very senior leaders, um, uh, being very encouraged, well, well nurtured. Um, and I'm really um, enjoying the opportunity to support other nurses to um, identify and understand where their work is already sustainable. Um, and I think that's that's um, highlighting a lot of things. Um, in terms of the future, um, I like not I don't think any of us know where where we're going, um, but I I would hope I hope that there will be opportunities for hybrid roles where I can continue some sustainability work and, and also go back to some clinical work. So um, um, we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, thank you so much, everyone. And I'm happy to answer any questions in the chat. Um, over to you, Minraj. Um, hard acts to follow. Um, it's really amazing to see so many people on, on this webinar and such interest in this. It's an amazing fellowship. So I'm Minraj, I'm one of the fellows, um, no brainer. Uh, and I'm a urologist by background, so surgical uh, trainee. 
uh, SD6 almost. And I guess I'm going to spend my five minutes just telling you a little bit about my motivations and drivers for applying to the fellowship, what I've been getting up to, and a little bit about what the future holds. And much like everyone else, it's still under construction, so to speak. So I guess, like probably some of you on the call, I've spent a bit of time coming on and off this medical conveyor belt, which seems endless. And I spent a lot of that time working within global health and in particular global surgery and really focusing on the sort of wider structural determinants of health. So how do we improve access to healthcare? How do we ensure that there is infrastructure in place for us to deliver healthcare safely and ensure that staff are uh, trained and available when needed? So really the sort of staff, stuff, space and systems of healthcare. And that's led to a lot of work within looking at how we build sustainable and resilient health systems. And during that whole time, I was always drawn to this map, which I'm sure many of you have seen. And it really highlights the sort of passion in me into, into why I, I applied in the first place. And it's really that inequity of climate change and the impact on health that it will have, that those that are least affected will be the ones that have contributed. Uh, the, those are the most affected, sorry, will be the ones that have contributed the least. Uh, next slide, please, Donna. So I guess coming back onto that conveyor belt, um, made lots of personal changes, joined quite a lot of social movements, you know, cycling everywhere, mostly because I, I love it, uh, but also because it is sustainable. Um, but doing all of that and then being confronted with the carbon footprint of the NHS and healthcare when you come into work, and especially in surgery and, and many aspects of healthcare where you see the sort of single use uh, items that we have, etc. And really wanting to move and escalate that into wider system change, much the same as, as Emma. And then COVID hit, uh, like many uh, of stories these days, there's always a COVID segue. And I found myself in a leadership role quite unexpectedly, and it was very challenging. It was definitely a, a growing phase for me. And I reflect back on it and I just thought, if I achieve that much in that kind of global crisis, as did we all, what could we do with a crisis that I feel incredibly passionate about? And that was really the segue to my application and it allowed me to bring some of that health system thinking, but also develop those leadership skills that I was trying to get a little taster of during COVID and move that forward while working on something I'm passionate on, which is climate change and trying to have a effect in my sphere. So within the NHS. Um, next slide, please, Donna. So, what I've been working on, um, I guess this sort of highlights some of the areas. Uh, the biggest bubble or one of the big bubbles there, other than the other fellows, which I'll come to in a minute, is uh, sort of communication and leadership. And I think it's really been around spreading that word. So I had lots of opportunities to give talks, especially in the lead up to COP and after and really engage and sit in on panels with people that I admire and look up to, which has been a phenomenal experience. And starting to build my own leadership style and leadership skill and communication of something that can sometimes be quite a difficult thing to, to spread to lots of different individuals and groups. I'm also working on a framework, so within the Green NHS, on how we design and deliver models of care with sort of environmental impact in mind. And then the project with Becky on looking at sort of green theatre initiatives to drive sort of circular economy principles within surgery and, and theatre. And that's allowed us to engage with people that we wouldn't normally uh, do, so supply and procurement individuals and get to know the system from a different angle. I'm hosted as I think there's been a couple of questions about hosts. So you get hosted in different organizations and I'm hosted within the Southwest region and sit within the medical directorate there. And that's really what's given me an insight into leadership at that level and how we really try to move national uh, strategy or policy into action at a regional level. And then obviously, meeting all the other incredible fellows which has been uh, an amazing experience and we really get on really well it's great to have a soundboard it's great to have a team that is so diverse in terms of their backgrounds and getting input from um, um, Ben and Emma on other aspects other than just sort of medicine and really I think there will be um, you know relationships for the future. <laughs> um, 
what what the future holds uh, much the same i'm not entirely sure but i can 100 say that this fellowship will have shaped my future career and will be a big part of what i go on to do um and it's been an incredible opportunity and it's not not over yet <laughs> um and i'll hand over to whoever's next donna uh avina it's me next. Thanks so much, Manraj. Um, so I'm Veena um, and I'm a GP trainee. So um, I've done my ST1, my first year of GP training before I started the fellowship. Um, although I had taken an F3 and an F4 year and um, for GP training as well. So yeah, taken a bit of a roundabout route to um, coming to this fellowship. Um, so when I saw the job came up, come up in the summer um, last year, I wasn't really kind of expecting it or looking for something like this. Although I was very passionate about climate change and health. Um, so I wasn't really expecting to take more time out of training but the reason I decided to apply for the scheme is because I was really passionate about the link between climate change and health and um, the problems that we're having in the world now and in the future um, and I felt that I would be really it would be amazing to be able to make a difference um, and try and reduce the carbon emissions of the NHS um, on a national scale having just done some kind of little local projects before that um, and I had done some work on sustainability in my hospital, but not a huge amount. Um, and I think my background is I've done more stuff at medical school in terms of sort of global health and some other leadership roles. So I think at first when I saw the scheme, I thought, oh, am I going to really have the qualifications to, to get in here because I haven't done um, as much as I thought maybe would be required. But when I had a look through the application, I actually realised that um, what I'd done did fit into the, the role of the sustainability fellowship. Um, and another hesitation I had about applying for the scheme was, I think, as some of the other people have mentioned, um, just being able to, you know, come back into training after a year out um, and not kind of having my guaranteed um, hospital rotation when I came back and things like that. But I think when I kind of thought about it a bit more, I realised that a lot of people do take time out of their training, whether that's because of um, fellowships or years out for other reasons, might be maternity leave or, or so many things. And actually there is a, a system set up to support people who come back from, from years out and there's um, supportive return to training schemes and um, there's lots of things people can do to, to, to help um, when you go back. So I realised that the kind of opportunity that I had here um, was going to be incredible and that it, those kind of concerns were outweighed by um, the opportunity that I've had. So I've been, we've been in the post for just almost five months now and it's been really incredible. Um, it's quite a learning curve when you start but um, I've been really well supported by um, the, Green NHS, oh, the Green NHS team and the host team that I'm with which is the primary care team at NHS England and it's really incredible to be able to work with uh, some of the kind of um, leaders in, in healthcare um, and have an insight into how the NHS works and how it's all run. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've been working on sustainable primary care and um, a big part of that has been liaising um, and developing networks with some of our um, external um, organisations such as Greener Practice, which is a, a kind of primary care network for sustainability and primary care um, with the Royal College of GPs and the Green Impact Path Toolkit. Um, and as you can see on this bubble chart, um, medicines and chemicals and uh, uh, are, are the biggest area of uh, sustainability in primary care. So that's what I've been mainly working on. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? So some of the areas I've been working on are low carbon asthma care, because um, inhalers, most of them are prescribed in, in primary care. Um, and we're, we're trying to shift the way asthma care, um, not just asthma, but respiratory care is delivered um, and, and, and switch to lower carbon um, inhalers and, and general models of the way, the way we deliver care. Um, so a lot of that is involving how we get education out to clinicians on a national level. I'm um, also doing a project on the asthma um, annual review to see how that can be um, improved to deliver um, higher quality and low carbon asthma care. Um, I'm also kind of gathering some case studies um, as I said, developing relationships with external organisations um, and looking at other areas which are important in primary care, such as social prescribing um, and estates and things like that as well. So, um, yeah, it's been an absolutely great five months so far and still got uh, more than half of the year left to go. Um, we're really close to group and it's been really nice to have a, a group of kind of like minded people to work with. Um, and the coaching and mentoring I've had from my seniors as well has been fantastic. 
Um, I don't know what I'm going to do after this year. I certainly will return to clinical work, whether that's full time or part time, I'm not sure. And I hope to continue with some of the sustainability work that I've done, um, whether that's in a sort of part time leadership role or whether that's something that I try and squeeze into the GP training that I'm doing. I'm not quite sure yet, but I know that I've learned so much and the people I've met and the networks I've gained here um, will definitely kind of help me in the future. Um, and hopefully help me to to be a leader in sustainability so thanks for hearing me and yeah i'll answer any questions in the chat as well thank you vina um ben whitaker i'm a mental health occupational therapist by training and i started practicing as an ot in 2008 and then in 2009 i started volunteering with the center for sustainable Healthcare, and for the yeah, 12 or so years. From then I did uh, one day a week working with CSH, Centre for Sustainable Healthcare, and four days a week clinical practice. And in my time at CSH, I was involved in leading, was involved in leading uh, occupational therapy and more recently AHP programmes, green walking and mental health recovery. I was involved in green wood competition and yeah the, when this job came up it, it yeah really felt like a, a dream job for me this is something that i'd been um, working in for a while and felt very passionately about for very many years and i'd uh, done some work with the chief allied health professions officers team and uh, yeah the opportunity of doing this work full time with a team that is so proactive with the sustainability agenda felt incredibly exciting and still feels incredibly exciting. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So yeah, I was aware coming into the team that they were going to be launching the Greener AHP Hub in October and that they're developing their five year next five year strategy, uh, which is due to be coming out in spring this year, which has environmental sustainability as one of its five themes. And these are, yeah, objectives in the fellowship are working um, on these at the moment. So yeah, today we've been developing the environmental strategy, environmental sustainability theme and the strategy. And a large part of my role is looking at um, development and implementation of the Green HP Hub. It's yeah, it's a very good resource. The the four um, number two to five on the uh, pictures on the top rows. The first the first principles about understanding sustainability. The other four are areas which um, AHPs can contribute or lead on in sustainable healthcare. And so it's looking how to develop those and how to communicate the information on the hub um, to other clinicians so people can carry this forward in practice. Other things that um, working on are around the models of care framework, um, which is being developed in Greener NHS, and I'm looking at implementing carbon calculated tool with supported self-care pathway looking at um, the development of sustainability networks for AHPs, which is something I was doing with CSH, but there are an awful lot of um, networking opportunities for clinicians out there. So people asking in the chat, how do you get involved in, in this? Have a look at what networking opportunities are out there and link in with people. And yeah, get, that's one way to get involved. And yeah, involved in um, sustainable supply chain work, looking at um, yeah, the AHP contribution to sustainable PPE and reuse of walking aids, and also been linking in um, or linked in with HE, looking at um, sustainable healthcare education for AHPs. The plan is next year that there will be two fellows with the CAPO team. Uh, one continuing the work that I'm doing with NHS EI and another working across Health Education England and the Office for Health Improvement and Disparities. 
so plans for the future I, i'm kind of in denial that this fellowship is going to end being as it's my dream job and um, like emma said it's a real privilege to be doing this work and yeah being with all the other fellows who are all, all awesome um but yeah I, I i will be taking a lot from this fellowship into the work that i'm doing same with healthcare i didn't realize coming to this fellowship what a senior role it would be and um what contact we would be having with leaders within the nhs and yeah it's, it's been a real privilege and it, yeah it's still really exciting um i'd be interested to know um how many ahps there are out there so if anyone wants to say hello in the chat it would be good to see um was going to be handing over to sophie unfortunately she's not able to join us this evening um so i will now hand over to kieran Shall I wait for you to do the slides? Oh uh, yeah, bear with me, Kira. So while Donna's sorting out, I can just kind of introduce myself because I think the bit about who I am is probably a little bit less interesting for you guys. So I'll just kind of summarize it in a nutshell. So I'm a trainee doctor um, I've gone through largely the usual route of training with a few kind of side roads here and there. Um, and I'm currently a trainee in rheumatology and general medicine. So leading up to this, I was kind of thinking, you know, what kind of things do I want to do in my career? I was generally kind of interested in strategy, you know, big picture thinking, all of that kind of rubbish. So I ended up actually applying for the National Medical Director Scheme, um, which you guys may have heard of, which is a slightly different scheme. Um, and I got into that, so you're probably wondering why the hell am I here? Uh, next slide, Donna. So essentially, as part of the medical director scheme, um, I got assigned to Greener NHS. Um, and so I've got basically no background in sustainability in terms of work. Um, so it was kind of by chance that I got um, put with Greener NHS, but essentially it's been a it's been really a, a blessing in disguise because it's a really dynamic team. There's a really welcoming group of people. And I've been, in a, uh, been able to develop an interest in a, a new area of work, essentially. So I've been involved in a few different projects. Um, some of them have been mentioned so far. So I've been working with Vina on low, uh, low carbon inhalers, doing a bit of work on models of care, which is quite a wide piece of work. Um, and also something called beneficial changes, which is essentially QI on a national level and trying to get sustainability, sustainability into it. But this is kind of a, a splurge of everything I've done over the first six months. And the reason I've put that up, you don't have to worry about the individual pictures, is essentially to show the variety of things that you can get involved with. So if I just kind of walk you through the slide, um, the start for me was really about upskilling my knowledge and uh, yeah, knowledge in climate change itself and the links with healthcare, because that was something I think I started at a pretty low baseline in. So there's lots of opportunity to do uh, things like carbon literacy, but even all the, all the people you speak to are much more, much more experienced in this area, depending on kind of what your background level is, um, allows you to pick up a lot of that stuff. The other learning are things about NHS structure and kind of being able to rub shoulders with senior people in the NHS. Um, that's been a really valuable experience as well. Um, and then kind of going on to the more specific things, there's so many things which you can do. So I've been involved in uh, really new skill, you know, developing new skills that I've never used before at work. So things like making a project plan with a strategic um, layout with milestones etc i've been interviewing for roles both fellows and other members within green run hs um, doing some news doing some bulletin editing script writing chairing meetings things like that so you, you get to do a lot of different things and you can kind of dip in and dip out to whatever you want to make of it essentially um, and one of the things that i think 
is uh, that has stood out to me compared to clinical training is that you're valued quite highly. So depending on what setting you're working in, you're, you're generally treated as an expert and someone who's bringing something new to the table. So I think in that sense, it's, uh, you're really valued and the work you do is, is definitely appreciated. But above all that, really, there's lots of chances to collaborate. You, you get to have lots of conversations with people about your ideas and your thoughts and get to bounce ideas off people. And it's a lot of fun. Um, and you get a lot of autonomy in terms of what you get involved with. So those are kind of the, the main things. The picture in the bottom left is my bathroom in its current state. So the other thing about this fellowship is there's a lot of flexibility. So I know the working from home change, uh, things are changing a bit, but I think it still probably will be a bit half-half. So you can um, work flexibly and kind of work late, but do different things in the day. Um, so in that sense, it's good for lifestyle as well. Next slide. So I'll stop talking quickly after this, but in terms of um, future opportunities, I haven't really decided what I'm going to do, but I think the main thing, whatever you do after this, that the fellowship brings is opening doors and you meet lots of people, you make new networks. And I think whatever you decide to do, and for me, it's, it's likely to be something within sustainability and healthcare, which is really something new for me. If you spoke to me, let's say a year or two ago, um, I've made enough contacts now to be able to kind of forge my own way. So it doesn't really matter, I think, what you do afterwards. Lots of doors will open for you. Um, and I know a few people were saying in the chat about um, applying and how much previous leadership and sustainability experience you need to have. I think the one thing I would say is, and Emma said it already, just don't undersell yourself. So, you know, you don't have to have co-authored the Lancet Countdown on Climate Change to apply for this fellowship. Like there's a diversity of both of profession, you know, of protected characteristics, but also of your previous experiences, everything, everyone can bring something to the table. So um, whether you, you know, get into this fellowship or not, or decide not to do it, you can even contribute in other ways. So don't be discouraged. That's it. Thank you so much to our clinical fellows, so much information shared there and thank you for our fellows for frantically uh, picking up some questions um, through the chat that have been really helpful and Ben getting a lot of love from the AHP community I see. Um, I'm going to pick up on a few common questions coming through. The first one is I'm going to pick on a few of our fellows just to expand a little bit more on their project, their scope of projects. Um, they may not be able to share detail, there may be some sensitivity, but just to get a sense of what kind of projects. Um, and fellows, if you're not able to share some, feel free to uh, hand over to your next fellow. So I'm, 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 I'm just gonna pick on, on one. So um, uh, Becky, are you able to share a little bit of detail about the project or project you've been working on? Yeah, so um, in terms of nitrous oxide, I'm working with Sophie, who couldn't be here tonight. She's also an anaesthetist. Um, so we're working on something called the nitrous oxide project, which you may have heard of, which is to do with reducing wastage of nitrous oxide um, in hospitals. So um, we kind of made a toolkit to make it easier for people to do that project in their own hospitals. Um, so that's obviously it's not out there yet, um, but it is kind of almost ready to go. Um, but with all kind of policy, there's always, you know, approvals processes and, and things to get it out. Um, and we're also working on kind of a, an anaesthetic working group. So a task and finish group to get things done, not just on nitrous oxide, but on other volatile gases um, and, and all the kind of hot topics in anaesthetics at the moment to do with, with carbon reduction. And so that's from the anaesthetic side. Um, with Manraj working on green theatre, so mainly looking at things like using reusables instead of disposables. When you look at that kind of thing, it's not a quick fix of just creating a how-to guide. There's actually lots of stakeholders involved. There's infection prevention and control, um, is infrastructure issues. So part of that work is a wider piece of work around picking apart some of those issues and seeing how we can make progress on that. And that's where our own clinical background comes in a lot because we actually have experience of using these things on the ground and we have some idea of what's involved and we can reach out to our networks of other clinicians and find out what they're doing in their hospitals and bring that information back to the national team and um, so that's how we can be really useful to the national team as clinical fellows as well. Thanks Becky and um, Vina, can I ask you to share some of your reflections about your projects? 
Thank you. So I've been working on a variety of things in primary care. Um, some of it is related to the contracts, um, relating to things like um, inhalers and uh, estates. Um, but the main thing I'm focusing on at the moment is the inhalers work because it is um, something that's very clinical and very primary care focused. So we're looking at getting a lot of educational materials out, um, whether that's in the sort of events, whether that's written materials, um, and trying to work on how we can get clinicians to change their behaviour in terms of how they prescribe and how they treat patients with respiratory conditions such as asthma. So I'm working on um, a couple of um, different projects, um, looking at mainly primary care um, and looking at practice nurses and the annual asthma review and how we can um, uh, get resources out and teaching out to ensure that um, people feel really confident in knowing how to treat patients with asthma um, and deliver high quality and low carbon respiratory care. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and one of the questions was about kind of what, what kind of uh, level of autonomy um, you have in the role. Um, can I ask um, Emma to share your thoughts on, on that from your perspective, please? Thank you. Yeah, I think that's one of the, um, we were actually reflecting on that as a group today, just talking about how um, we feel very privileged to be in a, in a place where there are certain principles and ideas that we've got. So the Green NHS, we're trying to reduce carbon across the NHS, we're trying to embed those ideas of sustainability across the NHS. But we actually have that freedom and flexibility to think about you know, how that might work within the area we're working. So for me, working within nursing, it's really been about, about building relationships and um, creating networks and, and, and really um, supporting my colleagues to, to understand where the work they're doing is already quite sustainable. But that's gone in a direction that's, um, some, it, you know, it's, you don't always know where you're going to go with these things. And um, it's, it's really been the networking with other people within um, Team CNO and, you um, uh, NHS England and, and things have evolved that way so it's been really exciting it's a real opportunity um, to, to be able to do that um, I hope that answers the question. Yeah that's fantastic thanks Emma um, and another question came out about kind of people's experience and reflections and the different opportunities across different directorates Ben can I ask you for your views about um, your experience um, in one directorate and, and, um, and the different opportunities that there have been across different ones if I may. Yeah, so I'm, I'm hosted by the CAPO team and uh, I, the, I, when I came there, because the CAPO team was so proactive about sustainability agenda, there, there were six objectives that were um, put to me, which I'm, is pretty much what I'm working on. But beyond that, there there is scope uh, within Green Run HS. Our, our induction, the first week with Green Run HS was amazing. It was like um, back to back calls with every different part of Green Room NHS and they're, they're decarbonising the NHS is huge and they're, they're focusing on each um, each area and we, were, we basically said if if you want to work on a particular project in a particular area then get in touch and so again that's that autonomy you can follow um, what, what projects you feel passionate about what you think um, you would like to get involved in so yeah there is scope and I think if I didn't if I didn't have the objectives I had coming into this, the, um, the, I, when I linked in with HE about the education and it was like, yeah, and then we could do this and we could do this and we could do this. And that there was so much there to be worked on, which is why there's next year, there's going to be a fellow that's partly based there. So th it is, um, although though I'm hosted with one, there are, there are opportunities elsewhere. Um, there was something else that I was um, going to mention in which I didn't, which may be useful for um, some people out there, is that although this is for band seven um, for the application, I was a band six clinician and I um, applied for it, hoping that my experience for the work I'd done with Centre for Sustainable Healthcare, even though that wasn't um, part of Agenda for Change, would be equivalent. And so what I did was I looked at the agenda for change. Um, oh, sorry, um, <coughs> managed to just get it to work on my phone. <coughs> Happy New Year. Oh, okay. how are you? So 
I um, yeah, I looked at what the descriptions were for band seven, band eight A, and tried to work out what other experience I'd had that was non-clinical that fitted in with that, and then highlighted that in the application. But yeah, just to say, if people are band six, then you can draw on your yeah your other experience, or maybe the experience you've had within your role. Um, within your band six role that may meet band seven, band eight, um, a criteria, but it's just you haven't been banded in that in your clinical role and use that in your application. Thanks, Ben, that's really helpful. Um, and, and a few people have talked about kind of the uniqueness of this opportunity. Manraj, I wonder if you could just spend just a minute talking about possibly one of the most unique opportunities you've had in this in the scheme, which would have been COP. Um, if you could share your your thoughts and kind of reflections on that. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, COP is a, a big one, uh, being able to be part of that planning and see it unfold. I think other unique opportunities are being able to have close contact with Nick Watts and his team and the Green NHS team. And I think if you, you know, know about sustainability in the Green NHS, there are certain um, areas that really sort of ring true and it sort of um what's the word I don't want to yeah just it's just amazing to be able to meet some of those individuals and work closely with them um I guess the other unique opportunities is I'm I think there's a couple of questions about hosts and maybe Donna you'll, you'll pick up on the type of hosts that um available so I've been based within the southwest uh, region so getting a regional perspective has been quite uh, useful I'm not sure that's going to continue next year but that was quite uh, a unique opportunity and being able to just meet like-minded people um, and have the opportunity to share ideas and bounce things off and work within an MDT um, has been quite uh, amazing. Thank you, that's really helpful. Um, I'll just pick up on that. So yes, the host organisation, um, so it's a, a slightly strange term. So for 2022-23, the hosted organisations will be within NHS England and NHS Improvement across various different directorates. Um, and uh, we're certainly keen to, to share the experience of different professions across different directorates. Um, the view of the scheme in the next couple of years is to explore um, other host organisations, both NHS and arms length bodies outside of NHS England. So that's a really exciting um, area of growth for the scheme. But currently it would be uh, different directorates within NHS England to give different scopes of projects, um, uh, all, all of which that are working with in and around the, uh, the Green NHS team's priorities. Okay, I'm just going to pick up on a few questions that have come through. I'm sorry, I, I think between the fellows and myself, we picked up on a lot of them, uh, but just a few things. Um, hopefully the location is clear. We appreciate um, that the idea is to find as kind of maximise these opportunities for the future, which is which is certainly our aim. But for those that aren't able to take up the position for this or other reasons, please do reapply in the future. Our aim is to grow the scheme year on year. So there will be a register your interest um, button available uh, for, uh, for the scheme on the web pages from tomorrow. We'll keep you updated on those opportunities. Unfortunately, you're not able to defer any places for this year. So if the time isn't right for you, please do register your interest and uh, consider applying next year or thereafter. So just to clarify, the scheme does start in September 2022 and it runs to the, the following August, so 12 months. As I said, there are multiple posts, at least seven posts available for, the, uh, for cohort two. And I'm just going to reflect on some of the next steps. And I'll just bring my screen up for your benefit. Okay, so I think at this point, we've only got a couple of moments left. So I really just want to focus on kind of what those next steps are for you. Hopefully we have given you as much information as possible about what the skill, what the scheme brings, the opportunities, and those insights for the clinical fellows are incredibly helpful. So I'd like to thank them for their time um, tonight. So the closing date for applications is the 23rd of February. So we have a few more weeks. Um, candidates will be notified um, within two weeks of that, and interviews will be held week commencing the 28th of March. So we will notify candidates as soon as possible. So keep those dates in your diary. 
It's just for me to say thank you again for joining us. Thank you for our clinical fellows who have represented the scheme so well and provided such great insights to the opportunity that this, schemes, this scheme offers. There is quite a lot of detail on the FNA website and the information pack, so do please download that and have a read of that after the uh, webinar tonight. Please reach out to us on Twitter um, using both the FMLM and the sustainability hashtag and hopefully uh, you'll be able to pick up some of our fellows uh, through that. But also if you have specific questions about your own circumstances um, or have some other questions about the scheme, please don't hesitate to email us um, on the email address you see on the screen. That's clinicalfellowscheme at fmlm.ac.uk. So it just leaves me to say thank you again for joining us. I hope it was useful. Thank you to our fellows. And if you do decide to make an application to the scheme, very best of luck. And uh, thank you and good night.